This is the fourth module of MCDB 3010 Teaching and Cures, a course-based undergraduate research experiences. In this module, we're going to talk about assessment and how you understand whether your students are learning. Before we move forward, let's back up and take a look at the things that we've covered in these modules. We've discussed ethics in teaching, which involves fairness, using inclusive language, and creating a safe learning environment for our students. We also discussed building an effective mentoring relationship by keeping expectations clear, teaching with respect, being a mentor and not a friend, fostering morale when experiments become difficult, and being patient, circulating and talking in our classes so our students understand that we are mentors. The importance of learning how to teach in a college classroom is emphasized by the shift in expectations between K through 12 and undergraduate education. In K through 12, teachers are responsible for student learning. So when a student isn't doing well, a parent will go immediately to the teacher to find out why. Unlike K through 12 in undergraduate education, the students are primarily responsible for their own learning. When a student isn't doing well, the student gets blamed. In this context, it's important to consider the types of education training that people in each of these groups receive. In K-12, there's mandated training and professional development required at local, state, and national levels. These are tracked throughout the careers of every educator in a K-12 program. For undergraduates, the professors are often not receiving any education training, and although it's more common for educators to seek it out, it is not mandated for undergraduate educators to receive any training or professional development related to teaching. In Module 2, we considered how people learn. For students who are just reading material, we can expect them to retain about 10% of the information. In a laboratory, we have the benefit of more retention because students are watching demonstrations, they're teaching, they're also participating in the activities. To understand how people learn, we have to think about the different personalities and learning types that we have in our classes. We can see that there are 16 different personality types that translate very well to learning styles when assessed by the Myers-Briggs assessment. When attempting to address all of these different learning styles, we have to incorporate different forms of active learning, or else we'll have a classroom of students who are simply sleeping. To present information, we discuss some different ways of doing this, including how to present a good talk. If you continue in your medical or science careers, you'll be expected to present information to different audiences. When doing this, you'll likely be presenting PowerPoints as you are in laboratory or maybe in lectures. So you can keep these tips in mind when you're presenting to be an effective speaker. So let's move forward to trying to understand whether our students are actually learning. In this module, you should expect to know how to use Bloom's taxonomy to evaluate assessments. You should also be able to distinguish between formative and summative assessments and understand the principle of backward design. To begin, let's consider this passage, the montillation and uses of Traxeline. This is an assignment that could be given to your students. It's very important to learn about Traxeline. Traxeline is a new form of Zionter. It is montiled in Suristana. The Suristanians found that they could crystallate large amounts of Furvon and then Bracter it to Quasal Traxeline. This new, more efficient bracterylation process has the potential to make Traxeline one of the most useful products within the molecular family of Lukaise's Sneezlaus. For many of our students, science sounds a lot like a different language, much like this passage. We could ask them a number of questions to see how much they understand. Some questions on a quiz might be, what is Traxeline? If you look at the passage, this is a question that's very easy to answer. Traxeline is a new form of Zionter. Where is it montilled? It's montilled in Suristana. How is Traxeline quasaled? Clearly, it's crystallated and then bractered into a new quasal. And why is the new bracterylation process superior to the old process of producing quasal Traxeline? Well, the obvious answer is that it's more efficient. Most of your students would get 100% on this quiz, but haven't learned a single thing about Traxeline, what it is, or what it does. So when you're asking students questions, you might want to think about the level of sophistication that's required to answer them. One way to do this is to think about your questions in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. In 1956, Benjamin Bloom, with collaborators Max Engelhart, Edward First, Walter Hill, and David Crothwall, 
published a framework for categorizing educational goals called the Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. Familiarly known as Bloom's Taxonomy, this framework has been applied by generations of K-12 teachers and college instructors in their teaching. The framework elaborated by Bloom and his collaborators consisted of six major categories, knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. The categories after knowledge were presented as skills and abilities with the understanding that knowledge was the necessary precondition for putting these skills and abilities into practice. While each category contains subcategories, all lying along a continuum from simple to complex and concrete to abstract, the taxonomy is popularly remembered according to the six main categories. The first category is knowledge. This is simple recall of information. It requires discovery, observation, maybe listing, locating, and naming. The quiz that you saw earlier is mainly based on just producing knowledge. And as I said, producing knowledge is the basis of everything else, so there has to be some level of memorizing and just learning concepts as you would when you're learning a new language understanding, translating, summarizing. So a student needs to take the knowledge and then return the knowledge to you in a different form. They might be demonstrating that they understand it. They might also be discussing it or debating a point. The next level is application. This is using and applying the knowledge, using problem solving methods, manipulating, designing, and experimenting. For most of our laboratory courses, we enter at this level with application. But again, it's important to understand that most students don't have the knowledge to get to this level. So you may be spending a fair amount of time teaching the students terms and basic techniques so that they can achieve this. Moving up the pyramid, we find analysis. This is identifying and analyzing patterns, organizing ideas, recognizing trends. In our laboratory, I like to have the students draw out concepts. If they can draw an idea, this usually involves some analysis and organizing of their ideas that they didn't previously have, or that they wouldn't receive just by reading information. When students receive data, they're going to be analyzing the data and hopefully interpreting it. Interpretation usually occurs at the level of synthesis. This is where a student is coming up with new ideas. They're synthesizing the information that they learned through application and analysis to predict what might happen next. This is a necessary quality for our laboratory courses. In the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy, students are evaluating their theories. Students in our labs will be forming hypotheses and testing them. In this final level of Bloom's taxonomy, students will be taking their data and figuring out what it means. They'll be judging the quality of the data. They'll be making recommendations about what should be done next. This highest level of learning is the epitome of a laboratory course. So what percentage of higher order Bloom's level questions would you expect to find on a typical intro bio exam? By higher order Bloom's taxonomy, we mean levels three through six, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. This question was asked by Zhang et al. in 2008 and published. What they found by surveying many public universities in the United States was that most undergraduate courses in science these are introductory courses, involve only knowledge, comprehension, and application, which is not entirely surprising since the students have to gain such a large base of knowledge before moving on to analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Undergraduate courses in biology therefore require a little bit more sophisticated thinking than AP bio courses do in high school. You see a slight shift from comprehension to application. This group also looked at the GREs and found something interesting, where there is a revisiting of comprehension and a slight increase in the amount of analysis required. So students in introductory courses in biology are receiving some of the information they need to be successful in the GREs. They're receiving the knowledge and comprehension that they need to do well on the exam, and they're also starting to get the analysis. But what's interesting is the GREs really doesn't emphasize application of information. This group then went on to look at the MCATs. If you're not familiar, the MCATs is the Medical College Admissions Test. This is a seven and a half hour test that many of you will be taking um, as a requirement for your medical school applications. There are many different components, including chemical and physical foundations of biological systems and critical analysis and reasoning skills, which is a large emphasis on the MCAT training. There's also biological and biochemical foundations of living systems and psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior. So this exam theoretically should have about 25% critical analysis and reasoning skills. 
So the group looked at this exam and compared it to AP Biology, undergraduate, and GRE questions. What they found is that the vast majority of the questions really rely on comprehension, which is a very low-level skill for the MCATs. To take this a bit further, they looked at first-year medical students, and what they found was suddenly a big increase again that looked almost like AP Biology in terms of just gaining knowledge. So a first-year medical student almost has to go backwards in their sophistication of learning, back down the Bloom's Taxonomy scale. So Bloom's Taxonomy forms a basis for understanding what our students know. For a laboratory course, we should be teaching the students the basic knowledge and comprehension, teaching them also how to apply and analyze, and hopefully with these skills, the students will be able to synthesize and evaluate their experimental data. So in terms of preparing our students for a career in science, I think these laboratory courses do a good job, and also to teach our students how to be literate, scientifically aware citizens. Medical schools are increasingly asking for research experience. The first year of medical school relies so heavily on knowledge and comprehension that perhaps incorporating research will develop the skills that the first year of medical school is lacking. So let's say you want to teach a student a concept. How do we do this and make sure that we're moving the students efficiently up the Bloom's taxonomy pyramid? One way to do this is to think about backwards design. In backwards design, rather than writing the exam first, you make a list of the skills that your students should know by the end of the class. Then you think about what evidence will convince you that they got there, and how will you help them get there. Starting with learning goals will help you understand how you should be assessing your students. You can use this worksheet to align your learning goals with the assessments that you'll use. Now this is not to say that you're going to be developing an entire course, but you can use this on a smaller scale when you're trying to teach your students pipetting, or if you're trying to teach them about the elements of experimental design. You should first ask yourself, what will the students learn in this lab? Design a learning objective that relates to the learning goal. To assess them, you should ask yourself, how will students demonstrate that they know it or able to do it? And when doing this, keep in mind that you should be remembering Bloom's taxonomy and that pyramid, because simply stating the information back to you at the knowledge level doesn't demonstrate that they actually know it. You can also create learning activities. What will students do to learn it? So keep in mind that the assessment and learning activity should be different. The learning activity will help them learn. The assessment will help you understand what they learned. In teaching education, you may hear terms like summative assessment and formative assessment. So let's first define what these things mean. Summative assessments are things like exams, papers, and presentations that typically occur at the end of the semester. In our case, the Cure Symposium is a great example of a summative assessment. It traditionally has been a major part of the grade for the class. However, many educators are recognizing that there are many components to a summative assessment, so these things are often broken up. Formative assessments occur during the teaching event or during the semester. These can be classroom assessments that are informal just in your interactions with students, homework or online assessments. These should provide regular feedback to the instructor and the students during the semester. So it's important that while you're trying to understand what the students learn, that you also share this with the students to identify gaps in their knowledge. So how do we know what we know? Here's an example used by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences to understand whether students can demonstrate a knowledge of evolution. The question reads, based on your understanding of natural selection and traits that vary along a continuum, explain the changes that occur in a tree and dinosaur population over time. Students may explain this in one of two ways. They may understand that over time, the ones that happen to be taller are going to be at an advantage and will survive, therefore making the average height of the dinosaur taller over time. However, many students may draw this image as a demonstration of their understanding of evolution, but what they're meaning to say is that that dinosaur in the middle is growing a longer neck so it can reach the leaves at the top of the trees. It turns out that this is a very common misunderstanding of evolution, that the individual organism adapts within its own lifetime to changes in the environment. So you could ask your students to demonstrate something like this through a drawing, but this may not give an accurate picture of what's happening. A way to modify this is to ask, 
How would you modify the 100 meter dash such that it would become an example of natural selection? In doing this in a real class of teaching assistants from previous semesters, we came up with many different answers. And the TAs really did demonstrate an understanding of how you might illuminate traits that you happen to have that might be an advantage in this setting. Some of the answers that we received were add hurdles. This would make it more challenging for some people and maybe the strongest, fastest runners would win. You could release a tiger behind the runners so the slower runners get eaten. You could kill the losers. You could also allow only the first two runners across the finish line to reproduce. These answers demonstrate a much better understanding of the idea of evolution, that the ones that inherently have a skill that will be beneficial in the long term are the ones that are going to survive and reproduce, and then the population will shift. So it selects for people who happen to be better on rocky, uneven ground. You could also select for, for the people who are going to be faster. So Bloom's taxonomy gives us a framework for understanding what we're asking our students. Are we just asking them what traxelation is? Are they able to just spit back what you told them five minutes before that? Are you asking them to apply it in a different setting, like the hurdles example in evolution? Ideally, we want our students in these laboratory courses to achieve levels four, five, and six, so that at the end of the semester, they'll be able to evaluate their own experiments synthesize the information, and then make recommendations for the next experiments that should be performed to understand the question that they had at the beginning of the semester. So in summary, summative assessments drive learning because it's attached to the grade. Formative assessment is one of the most important strategies for aiding and improving learning. In this process, what you can do throughout the semester is probe them to find out what they're learning and to give them feedback on how they might improve. Remember that you should have a clear idea of what you want your students to learn with the assessments that you administer throughout the semester as well as the learning activities that you provide for the students in class.